Blessings, blessings, blessings. Good morning, Redeemer. Good morning. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to be in God's house today. Uh, it's always an honor to come and share the word of God uh, on this pulpit. Um, I'm honored by the gesture by uh, Pastor David uh, to have asked me to come and share God's word. Um, it's my prayer this morning that uh, someone gets encouraged. Um, that's pretty much, in a nutshell, what my assignment is today, is to encourage someone, uh, to comfort someone, and just uh, remind us that God is with us, no matter what we are going through. We're going to turn very quickly to the book of Job, the book of Job in the Old Testament, chapter 1, uh, Job chapter 1, verse 1 to uh, 5, and then we will skip to Job chapter 3, um, and we'll read uh, about the first 16 verses of chapter 3. So to begin with, this Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. The Bible reads, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 ship, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. If you've never been a farmer before, uh, you may not know the value of having all those animals that he had. And very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did continually. Uh, if, if, if you are a parent who has children and uh, involved in all kinds of things, I think you can identify with Job there. Uh, uh, I, I was just curious to see uh, in our contemporary terms just how rich Job might have been. I, 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 would, I, I just could not find concrete answers, but it looks like uh, some, some speculators put him somewhere between 50 to 60 million dollars if Job lived in this life. Could be more, but he was a pretty wealthy man. Now, I'm going to pause real quick before we jump to chapter 3 and just give a recap of what's happening in the remaining part of chapter 1 and chapter 2, because it's just too long. I don't want to stand here reading for the next couple hours. Uh, so, so what's happening here in the remaining part of chapter 1 and chapter 2, there's a conversation happening in the heavenly places, unbeknownst to Job. Uh, Satan and God are having a conversation. Satan, he's accusing Job of uh, leaving this life. He leaves God-fearing only because he's been blessed. That's what he thinks. And the Lord allows Satan to test Job and prove it for himself, that he was wrong. So Satan, by God's permission, attacks Job. And Job finds himself in the middle of three crises. Job loses all his children. Job loses all his wealth. Job loses all his possessions. Job loses his health. All kinds of things are happening on top of that, in the middle of all that, Job's wife tempts him to curse God and die. 
And thirdly, Job had become the target of unfounded, unfair suspicions and accusations from his friends who had concluded that the reason why he was suffering was simply because Job had sinned against God and he needed to repent from that. When you are going through something like that, some miserable circumstances, the, the, the last thing you want is some group of wannabe friends who jump to conclusions about your situation. You can just imagine what Job was experiencing, considering all the pain that Job is going through. And now we come to chapter 3 after all these things have happened and transpired, and he has friends that are accusing him that he is suffering because he has sinned, Job opens his mouth in chapter 3. And Job begins to lament about his birth. Chapter 3, verse 1, Job says, uh, the Bible says, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, let the day perish on which I was born. And the night that said, a man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it that night. Let thick darkness Seize it. Let not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Come out from the womb and expire. Why did the knees receive me? Why the breasts that I should nurse? For then I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not as a hidden, still-born child, as infants who never see the light? That's a... Those are words coming from a man who's breaking, a man in a miserable, difficult, horrible situation that has shaken him to the core. Now, for the sake of our sermon, the title is much more than our miseries much more than our miseries. Why don't you look at the person sitting next to you and just tell them you are so much more than your miseries. And say this to yourself, I am so much more than my miseries. Uh, Webster defines misery as a state of suffering and want that is the result of poverty or affliction. Another definition of misery is a circumstance or a thing or a place that causes suffering or discomfort. Another definition of misery is a state of great unhappiness and emotional distress. So when you think about misery in relation to our sermon today, think of affliction, think of suffering, discomfort, think of unhappiness and emotional distress. All these are things that Job is experiencing and going through. Let us go to the Lord in prayer as we 
proceed with our sermon today. Dear God, we thank you that you are here in this place. Lord, I am weak, but you are strong. Lord, my, my words are empty and impotent, but your words are powerful. Your word is powerful and sharper than a double-edged sword. So as I stand here this morning, God, I pray that I will speak as one that speaks the very words of God that I able to pierce through the bone and marrow and encourage and comfort and strengthen one who finds themselves in the midst of a miserable circumstance. So speak, Lord, this morning through this feeble vessel in the name of Jesus. We praise you, God. Amen. I'm going to ask the audiovisual team to play a couple of videos that I have asked them to play for me. So you can play them back to back, please. Thank you. Yeah, so you still think killing yourself would make everyone feel happier, right? Oh, I don't know. I guess you're right. I suppose it would been better if I'd never been born at all. What'd you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. Oh, you mustn't say things like that. You... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's an idea. What do you think? Yeah, I'll do it. All right. You've got your wish. You've never been born. You don't have to make all that fuss about it. What? Well, this ought to be Martini's place. Look, who are you? I told you, George, I'm your guardian angel. Yeah, yeah, I know. You told me that. What else are you? What are you? You a hypnotist? No, of course not. Well, then why am I seeing all these strange things? Here? Don't you understand, George? It's because you were not born. Well, if I wasn't born, who am I? You're nobody. You have no identity. Oh, what do you mean, no identity? My name's George Bailey. There is no George Bailey. You have no papers, no cards, no driver's license, no 4F card, no insurance policy. They're not there either. What? Zuzu's petals. You've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like without you. Now, wait a minute here. Wait a minute here. Now, this is some sort of a funny dream I'm having. So long, Mr. I'm going home. Home? What home? Now, shut up! Cut it out! You, you, you're, you, you're crazy, that's what I think. You're, you're screwy. You're driving me crazy, too. I'm seeing things here. I'm going home and see my wife and family. You understand that? And I'm going home alone. How am I doing, Joseph? Thanks. No, I didn't have a drink. Who can guess what that movie is? It's a wonderful life, right? Uh, I think by far it's one of my most favorite movies, uh, holiday movies. Uh, I wish I had only discovered this movie way back. First time I watched it, I think, was, I don't know if it was about four, five, maybe, I don't know, somewhere between five to eight years ago. Um, and, and it's just a movie that I enjoy so much. 
each time a year is coming to an end before we transition to the uh, new year, I always want to close my year watching that movie as I reflect about, uh, upon the things that have transpired in the year that's just ending. It's just so inspiring uh, to watch that movie. It's a wonderful life. The, the, the movie, uh, for those who've not watched it, uh, the movie opens on an evening when George Bailey was contemplating taking his own life uh, because of the circumstances that he had found himself in. It was Christmas Eve, and as the prayers of people who loved George reached heaven, they were praying for him, an angel named Clarence Ardbody, the one that you just saw there, he also called himself AS2, or Angel Second Class, because he didn't have wings. Uh, Clarence is summoned to go and rescue George before he ends it all. Of course, Clarence is excited to go and come down and rescue a human uh, because, you know, it would help him earn his angel wings, something that he was really desperate for. But, but right before Clarence descends to the earth to save George, he's given a flashback of George's entire life up to that point in his hometown of Bedford Falls. Studying when George was very young, the angel gets to see how George had, had given up his childhood dreams to travel the world but he decided to stay and remain in his hometown to run his family business and serve the people of his town. So basically, as the, the angel gets to see all these different flashbacks, he gets to see how George Bailey's empathy and grace and decisiveness had literally saved people's lives, including his very own young brother, Harry, who was on the verge of drowning. All these things that the angel was uh, having to see, all these flashbacks were meant to show that George Bailey's life was a well-lived life and not a wasted life. But the moment George Bailey's uncle loses $8,000 of the family business, which was a lot of money in those days, 1946, uh, in terms of 2023, we're talking of somewhere around $121,000 for a small business. That's a lot of money. So his uncle had lost the money. The company deposits, which had ended up in the hands of Mr. Henry Porter, the wealthiest and meanest man in town, George Bailey finds himself on the brink of a personal disaster that would impact the people of his town and make him vulnerable to prosecution. So George goes home. As he contemplates all these things that are happening, he walks into his house. He's losing his temper with his kids, losing his temper with his wife before he decides to stomp out of the house and finds himself sitting in a tavern in desperation, as he sits in that place, George Bailey whispers a prayer to God, and he says, Dear Heavenly Father, I am not a praying man, but if you are up there and can hear me, show me the way. I am at the end of my rope. Show me the way. Shortly after that prayer, George Bailey steps out of that place and heads for the bridge, ready to act on his plan to end his life. But that's where he encounters Clarence, his guardian angel, who keeps George Bailey from acting on his plan and engages him in a series of conversations. And the clips that we just saw are some of those conversations that Clarence has with George Bailey. Uh, it's quite a funny character. I, 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 I really enjoy just listening to the conversations, and, uh, and at, po at some points, George Bailey gets frustrated, and he accuses uh, uh, Clarence uh, of being uh, a fallen angel <laughs> or some hypnotist or something. He's getting frustrated in those conversations as the movie goes. The thing is, 
earthly miseries or earthly troubles and hardships can really make us, easily make us, cancel ourselves out from the destiny that God has for us, as we saw in the case of George Bailey. The stresses of this life can leave us feeling numb and take a huge toll on our lives, both uh, mentally, emotionally, and even physically. One thing that I came across as we were contemplating or uh, uh, commemorating the birth date of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I came across a fact that I didn't know about, which was that when he died, the medical examiner, upon looking at his heart, he died at age 39. But Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had the heart of a 60-year-old man. And the conclusion was that the wear and tear of his heart had everything to do with the stresses that he faced in his fights for civil rights. Our miseries and troubles and hardships can take a toll on our lives and sometimes drive us to the edge where we feel like we don't have any way out of our situations. And that's where George Bailey finds himself in. George Bailey seemed like he was making a mark in his family. If you follow the movie, it seemed like he was making a mark in his hometown, doing great things, trying to help people in the town. But the weight of his miseries, the weight of his troubles, the weight of his difficult circumstances pushed him to the point of him questioning his existence. And he felt as though his, his life had been a waste. And that's why he said he would wish that he had never been born. What George Bailey didn't know was the fact that he had actually lived a wonderful life. Because he had done many good things that had helped people prior to this difficult moment that he had found himself in. He had touched many people's lives. He had saved his brother. He saved the people of the town from, from the hands of this greedy businessman. He, he, he tried his best to be as a blessing to people as he could. But considering the situations that he was facing, he felt as if his life was nothing but a waste. Now, to allow George Beatty to see what life would have been like in the world without him, as we saw in the clip, Clarence erases his identity because George Beatty wished he had never been born. So he said, okay, I'm going to erase your identity. You have never been born. And all of a sudden, everything around George Bailey changes. And as he walks around and he's trying to talk to people that he used to know, nobody recognizes him, and he's getting frustrated because he had never been born. So if George Beatty was never born, then he left a huge hole in the world, which means all the positive things he had done are now reversed, which then means that every person he had saved, including his young brother, who was about to drown, then his brother had drowned because George Bailey was never born. And this, this, this thing now sets up a domino effect of negative things all around him. And George Bailey can't believe the things that he sees. And he begins to get frustrated with this, this angel. And he really wants to come out of that situation, that dream, and he wants to get back to his life and see his family. And Clarence now takes the opportunity in one of the conversations, and he's, he said something that really struck me, and he says this to George Bailey. He says, strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many others, and when he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? 
Each man's life touches so many others, and when he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? My brothers and sisters, that is exactly where Job in the Bible finds himself, as we read in the passage. Job had lost everything. He was the greatest of the people in the Far East. He had everything, all the wealth that a person could ask for. He lost all that. He lost his children. He lost his possessions. He lost his health. Everything was taken from him. Imagine a God-fearing man, a noble man like Job, who had a reputation for strengthening the lives of others. Imagine Job breaking down and thinking that his life was nothing but a waste, but a waste, wishing that it would have been better if he had never been born. How could Job, a man like that, who feared God, a man of integrity, a man that seemed like he had everything, spiritually and materially, a man of that stature, how could Job come to that point? I think the answer is simple, and I believe all of us know the answer. And the answer is Job was human with flesh and blood, just like all of us. Secondly, the Lord never offers us immunity from losses. The Lord never offers us immunity from afflictions. Because even Jesus reminded his disciples and he said, in this world you will have many troubles. And when you read the book of Isaiah, the, prof the prophet Isaiah also spoke of a suffering servant whom he described as one who would be despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And that pointed to the suffering Messiah in Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, our faith in God was never meant to act as an inoculation from losses, and hardships. The good news is that even though the Lord doesn't offer us immunity from losses and hardships, He does offer us security. Security such that even though we may find ourselves walking through the valley of the shadow of death, He's right there with us, walking alongside us, holding us with His mighty hand. And even when the ground around us feels like it's sinking sand, we know that we can hold on to his unchanging hand because the Lord stands. So then we have to constantly remind ourselves that our power and ability to persevere through the trials of this life rest in our knowledge of who God is and our abiding trust in the promises that he has for us. In Job's case, while it, seemed as if, uh, while it seemed as if his faith was cracking under the pressure, as we read in chapter 3, when he wished he had never been born, one thing we discover as we read his story, Job, uh, God was not finished with Job. Because his story doesn't end in chapter 3. Aren't you glad that Job's life and Job's story doesn't end in chapter 3? Why don't you look at the person sitting next to you and just say, God is not finished with you. He's still working on you. God is not finished with you. Job's story doesn't end in chapter 3. Discouraged and doubtful as he might have been at times, the more we uncover his story, the more we see glimmers of hope through some really powerful affirmations which he made as he encouraged himself in the Lord. For example, in Job chapter 13, verse 15, Job says, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Some versions say, I will trust in him. In Job chapter 14, verse 7, Job says, For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, that its shoots 
will not cease. In chapter 19, verse 25 to 27, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, and yet in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Chapter 23, verse 10, Job says, But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. What Job is reminding us here is that no matter how low we've been cut, there's still hope for you. No matter how dead your situation is, your Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, our Redeemer lives, and His resurrection power is still at work. His resurrection power is still able to see us through in our circumstances. No matter how many people or how few people understand your situation, be rest assured that your Redeemer knows the way that you take. And even much more than that, he doesn't just know the way that you take. He is the way, your way through the valley. He is your way out of the valley. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And this morning, I just want to ask us a question. Do we have any jobs among us? Do we have any jobs among us? Do we have any George Baileys among us this morning? Or could it be that the person sitting next to you might be the job among us? Do you find yourself in the middle of a miserable, difficult situation that you can't explain, you can't understand. There's no rational way of understanding something that's beyond your control. Perhaps there's a doctor's report that leaves you with no hope. Perhaps you've been trying to have children and you've tried for years and there's just no way of explaining it. The doctors look at you and your report and they say everything looks fine. We just don't understand why this is happening. Perhaps you've, you've, you've tried doing a business and running a business and you failed. Every time you've tried, nothing seems to work. Perhaps your years of retirement are not working out the way that you, are, you had anticipated at this point. And you are going through some very difficult moments. For some of us, our predicament is public. Maybe uh, people who know what we're going through and they know how long we've been in that situation, like Job, he's struggling and he's suffering, he's in a miserable situation, and his three friends who I really don't consider friends at this point, they're nothing but miserable counselors. Or perhaps our situation is not necessarily public. Maybe you're going through some difficult moments that nobody but God knows. You're home, and you're crushed on the inside, breaking on the inside, going through circumstances that nobody but God knows. Do we have any job, any jobs among us this morning? You're going through situations that have left you feeling numb. You've cried oceans of tears that have blinded you from even seeing the value of your existence. Like George Belly and Job, you find yourself questioning why in the world you were even born into this world. When you look at everything that you were going through, you just feel like your life is nothing but a waste. May I submit to you today that we are not what has happened to us because the one who lives inside of us is greater than our miseries the God that lives inside of you is greater than your difficult circumstances your greatest hardship that you can ever face he is much greater than that his grace 
is greater than our miseries. His power is greater than our miseries. His name is greater than our miseries. His plans and purposes that he has for your life are greater than your miseries. And so is his love. It's greater than your greatest miseries. So then, just because you have suffered some losses does not mean that you are a loser. Just because you have failed in doing some things and, or accomplishing or achieving certain things doesn't mean that you are a failure. And just because you're going through some miserable situations doesn't mean you yourself as a child of God, you yourself as a person are a miserable person. There is so much more to you than your miseries. There is more to you than your hardships. There is more to you than the struggles that you are facing. You are not what's happening to you. You are not what has happened to you. You have a unique value in you. You have that image of God in you that can never be erased by your miseries or your hardships or your struggles or your problems. And while this life's miseries and hardships may make you feel like your existence is a waste, what you may not realize is that there are some things that you've done, there are some places you've been, there are people that you've touched, even those seemingly simple acts of grace and kindness that have literally saved people's lives, just like George Bailey. Things that you don't even know about. It could have been somebody you meet at the grocery store that you go to every week. It could have been some, somebody that you met somewhere in, in the shopping mall or at the hospital, wherever you work. You may not realize the impact that you're making on people. Only heaven would tell just the impact that we're making on people. And sometimes our circumstances can get us to a point where we get so frustrated and we feel like we've not been making a positive impact. We feel like we just we would rather have never existed at all. How many remember D.L. Moody, one of the greatest 19th century American evangelists? D.L. Moody became a household name that he came to be simply because one man named Edward Kimball extended grace to a young man that he had found working in a stock room of his uncle's shoe store. He was just working in a stock room of a shoe store. And he spoke to him about the love of Jesus. And D.L. Moody's life changes. And today we know him as one of the greatest evangelists of the 19th century. What if at some point after doing that, they went separate ways. Edward Kimball goes through some situations that leave him feeling so miserable to the point where he even does not realize that he had touched somebody that became one of the greatest evangelists of the 19th century. There is more to you than your greatest miseries. There is more to you than the troubles. There's more to you than your hardships. If we can just trust in God, if we can just look to the Lord, regardless of what's happening, if we can just find that grace that God has for us, we will be able to go through no matter what comes our way. No matter how our story ends, we're going to trust in the God that holds us. The God that's going to stand. The God that, was, that, that is going to give us the victory. May we all 
Never let the circumstances that we go through define us. May we never let our pains define us. May we look to God and encourage ourselves in these difficult times. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you this morning that we are not alone, that we are not helpless, that we are not hopeless, but you are with us. May we trust in you. May we hope in you. May we look to you, God. We thank you that your word reminds us that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor principalities, nor suffering, nor nothing shall separate us from the love of God. There is more to us there is more to who we are than the things that we are going through. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.